Most Holy Father, we know that your word was, was uh, established before creation, and it's been revealed through the prophets, through the apostles, in any person you've elected uh, to tap and use to, to breathe your word out into paper. We thank you, Lord, that you put it in writing so that it wouldn't change. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit, who was there with you at the beginning, the love of God being poured out that is now available to every Christian that we could hear the counsel of God. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, who writes to the holy churches, saying, He who has an ear, let him hear. Oh God, if there's anyone here today that has not fallen in love with Jesus, we pray today would be that day that they would have an ear. For those of us who are already Christians, who've already been born again, who have ears that hear, may we listen. May we not be proud, may we not be self-reliant, but may we hear and listen. We pray this in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Amen. Chapter 6. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seventh. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Each rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Each rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, my Lord. And there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? and avenge our blood. Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed, just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and Luke and was stunned. Okay, so, so far in the Revelation, we've seen the Father, who is enthroned. We've seen the Lamb of God, who is Jesus Christ, who is alone worthy to take the scroll out of the Father's hand, who has his will pre-written. And John beholds his only desire now, that he's seen the one on the throne, is to see the will of God done. That's all he wants. 
And that's a, that's a check yourself kind of question. What do you want more than anything else? Is it your will or God's pre-written will to be accomplished? His whole hope is found in that. And God, God's own Son, Jesus Christ, is then presented. Nobody else in all creation could open the scroll except Jesus. Jesus appears in the form of a lamb who was slain and is now victorious. He takes the scroll. As it shifts from the Father to the Son, it shifts from the, what is created to what will be created. Um, and so Jesus takes the scroll and begins, in today's scripture, opening the seals. Now the point, again, is that this world will be replaced. It will be um, recreated. There will be a specific geographical location that is called Zion that is enormous. It will be set apart. We think it will be elevated in some way. And then the holy city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, which is God's city, will be brought down from heaven. It is not built by us. It is given by God. The chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. The city will come down and kiss Zion, and that they will touch each other, and there they shall be. The city will be populated by resurrected, redeemed Christians, sinners saved by grace, blood-bought people. Therefore, and those are, that's still not the goal, that's the setting, the, the location, the city, the population, resulting in the perfect conditions for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to openly dwell without concealing any of their glory. That's where this is going. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. That's the whole point of Christianity. Is in, in, uh, as when I teach on soul winning, sharing the gospel, the saying goes, the church does not have a mission. God's mission has a church. That's what's going to happen. In any church, uh, all Christians are the blood-bought people. And if you want to be involved in an active congregation that's part of God's mission, you have got to submit to the purposes of Scripture that have been outlined here. You'll see that, I mean, it's, that's not just a New Testament concept. This is prophesied in the Old Testament repeatedly. This is the whole point of the promise to Abraham. I will give you a place, and I will give you a people, and every nation of the world shall be blessed through you. What God was not saying to Abraham is that, I'm going to lift up a man named Saul, then a man named David, and then they're going to conquer this city, they're going to build a temple, and then they're going to reign over it in human terms, and, and every once in a while, I'm going to let a foreigner enter into the city gates. That's a very, uh, that's a brief, the Old Testament history is a brief shadow or foreshadow of the real one, which is to come. That's the true promise to Abraham, that he is still... Uh, Hebrews says he's part of the great cloud of witnesses waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. That's why we sing the song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, and daughters. Uh, so, so the seals are being opened now, and you'll notice some parallels in the writing, um, in the revelation given. Um, chapters 5 through, chapter, through the very first verse of chapter 8 show the seven seals. That's eight chapter one. Uh, chapter eight verse one is where the seventh seal is broken, and then it gets deeply into that. But you have the seven seals, and then the next section, chapter eight through chapter eleven, are is specifically the seventh seal. Those those are uh, written in such a way that they're real parallel in structure. First thing you see when the seventh seal is open, there are seven judgments in the seventh seal. And, and so the, the Revelation chooses to uh, highlight in detail that last seal. So what you'll find parallel between the two movements is that there are six judgments, and then there is an interlude revealing God's love and mercy for His people, and then the final uh, affli infliction and judgment, and it always concludes with Jesus' return. That's the flow. Uh, in fact, we heard, we heard today, after the uh, sixth seal, the kings start writhing and crying out because Jesus is coming back. That's, what they faced up to that point is nothing compared to the terror when they're calling up for the rocks to come and fall on us. Conquest, war, famine, mass death, okay. But when the earth started to lay bare, 
and they had no place to hide from the face of the one enthroned, that's what terrified them. So I've written underneath there that before Jesus, before Jesus returns, there will be, in parentheses, must be preparation. That sounds like John the Baptist. <laughs> every valley lifted up, every mountain laid go. There's always preparation for the day of the Lord. This is the ultimate preparation for the day of the Lord, which will be done by the hand of God Himself. I've written that Jesus does not come back to, come back to correct what has happened. All the things we're about to see. He's not come back to correct them. Or in spite of what is about to happen. Rather, these things are written, willed, and purposed as God's plans preceding the return of Jesus and the recreation of the world. Not only is God and the Lamb in control in terms of defense, they are causing this to happen. They're, they're causing this to happen. What, uh, and that's hard to, to grasp because we tend to paint a picture where Jesus comes to bail everything out. Or maybe that you've got two different wills. You've got the will of God the Father and the will of Jesus. And God the Father is just a big, mean old, you name it. And Jesus is the merciful one coming in to bail us out at the last second. There's only one will. It's the Father's will. It's enacted by the muscle of the Son. And it is, uh, it is uh, applied by the Holy Spirit. And so the way the book of Revelation writes is that these are um, necessary. It's similar to w when you ask, why did Jesus die on the cross? It was God's will. It was God's will. Um, in the words of Jesus, this must take place. It's necessary. It must take place because it was written in the Bible. It must take place because it was prophesied before these days. It must take place because this was the covenant the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit made before we fell into sin. It's necessary. Um, in, in full disclosure, that dramatically changes the way I interpreted this book the last time we taught it. The last time we taught it, I taught, which is incorrect in my now opinion, that the four horsemen are the result of sin and have been running amok on the earth already and God's just opening our eyes to see what He sees. But that's a stretch. And the reason, let me point out, I'm arguing with myself now. I'm arguing with Paul from 2015. So if you go to Zechariah, just briefly, if you'll turn with me to Zechariah, it's in the Old Testament, so... I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, what page? Yeah. I think it's the second to last. It's the second to last book in the Old Testament. Good. At Zechariah chapter six. Jennifer knows what she's doing. It's easy on the digital. Same with Kathy. Six. Six. So we just look at Zechariah 6. Again, when God's doing something new, he, the, the, all we know about God is what He's told us. He never contradicts Himself, but He might tell us things in the New Testament that He hasn't told us in the Old Testament. But many times, he says things in the New Testament that he's always already said in the Old Testament. But now they make a little bit more sense because they're framed under the mercy of Jesus Christ. We mentioned on Sunday that the praise of God's people, uh, we mentioned it here too last week, the praise of God's people has always been uh, linked to our knowledge of God. Uh, when he would do something, Miriam would dance when he split the Red Sea and then took out all the Egyptians. When he, so when he would do something mighty, the people of God would praise him. The reason God does anything is for the praise of his glory. So he revealed himself to Abraham. He revealed more of his character to Moses. He revealed his, his deeds to all the people. 
And then through the prophets, he spoke to reveal more of his character. But in, and it was in there if you wanted to see it, but people didn't see it. For instance, let man be created in our image, to me is a clear <coughs> statement that the Trinity was active at the moment of creation. Uh, but nobody had the heart or the eyes to see that because God hadn't opened it yet. When Jesus Christ came on the scene, and we started to, to, to zero in and microscope the Trinity, the, the, the God, and realize that there's three persons in one God, which is unbelievably mystical. And if, again, as I've said, if you can comprehend it, then you don't have it. It's something to apprehend, not comprehend. So it's like the virgin birth. Just, just accept it. Uh, if, uh, so a lot of people try to, and, and real quick, be careful on people explaining the Trinity because almost every explanation of the Trinity is a heresy. Modalism, partialism, uh, you name, there are all these isms about, uh, anyhow, we'll get into that another day. But when God would reveal himself uh, now through Jesus and then the Holy Spirit and you can see more of God, there's more accurate and consistent praise of God. You know him better. You see him better. That's how it is. The Old Testament was written. It's good and it's praiseworthy. When the New Testament was written, you started to tremble more at this concept that he wrote in Zechariah 6, these four horsemen. This is not a New Testament only thing, but it is definitely in the New Testament. But I'm just going to point out one thing here. Verse, chapter 6, verse 1. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming from between two mountains, mountains of bronze, the first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white, the fourth dapple, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, What are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, These are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The one with the black horse is going toward the north country, the one to the white to the west, the one to the dapples to the south. When the powerful horses went out, they were straining to go throughout the earth. And he said, go throughout the earth. So they went throughout the earth. You already have this image. And it's defined here as these are the four spirits of God. You go read things like uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, when the Spirit of God had withdrawn from Saul and laid on David though Saul still remained to be the anointed king at the time. David was the anointed coming king. You also see in, in 1 Samuel 18, I think verse 7, that an evil spirit proceeded from the Lord to Saul, so that Saul desired to kill David. Uh, there's another scripture in Exodus when Moses is going back to Egypt after hearing from God through the bush, and on the way... An evil spirit from God comes to kill him and his son because his son's not circumcised. And so his daughter, his wife, uh, Zipporah, grabs a knife and circumcises the boy and touches his heels with the foreskin. I don't know why, but we could study that another day. But the point is, there's this sense of, there's this sense where evil is sovereign and God's just struggling to maintain it. When the Bible teaches that God's sovereign and evil itself is submitted to God. Now that's very offensive to many of us. But I'm here to teach what the Bible says. And in the book of Revelation and in the book of Zechariah, it shows that, in, and I've written here on our notes, these four spirits, that's what they call these four horsemen, these four spirits of heaven are going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the whole world. Now you might say, well, maybe those are different horses. You can try, I guess, but uh, I don't know why. I don't. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense why they would have the same situation and then repeat it in the New Testament. So we, as we turn to chapter six, I, all I said that was to make the point that not only is God in control, which is normally a defensive thing. When things seem out of control, we say, but we can trust that God's in control. But what we're normally saying is that this situation is not out of control. I don't understand it. God will help me. God. But the last thing we want to say is that God is the one causing this to happen. See how I mean? Control normally means a defensive posture, whereas causing to happen is more of an offensive posture. And that's where I'd like us to consider the, se the seven seals of God, not as, again, arguing with myself years ago, not as God trying to negotiate, strive against, or, you know, God can snap his fingers and the devil disappears. Right? He's a created being, God's sovereign, and yet God allows him to remain for a purpose, even though 
the Lucifer, Lucifer has no redeemable quality in him at all, God still finds it useful for his glory to keep him here for now, though he's been judged and he will die. So we get to the four, we're just going to look at the four horsemen. I meant to, to highlight them so you can underline a white horse, a red horse. But there's a rhythm that's developed here. And so verse 6, chapter, I mean, chapter 6, verse 1, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Now who's opening it? The lamb. The lamb. And so the whole time, this, the problem remains. If the lamb walks away from the scroll or if God pulls the scroll back from the lamb's hand, the will of God's not going to be done. The whole hope here is that the one who wrote the will, which is a perfect will and, uh, and precepts from the Father, the one who wrote the will and the one who can crack the seal will keep doing it. If God the Father or the Son decides, I'm done, we're good here. We're going we're gonna, to, this situation right now, we're just going to let that hold for eternity. If he chose to do that, we'd be stuck. We're at the mercy of God. So the Lamb himself opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice, Come! According to that thing. Uh, come. And so that's, if you look at verse uh, 1, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 7, that's the same um, the same pattern, that God wills, Jesus enacts, and heaven cries, come. And at the commandment, at the enabling of Christ, and the commandment of heaven, then a white horse comes. Then a red horse, a black horse, and a pale green horse. Um, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. That phrase, I looked, in Greek it's, I looked, and then I beheld. The language is very clear. You know, you can look at something and not really see it. You ever had a dream? It was more than a dream. You still remember it? The details? The Bible would call that a trance. Uh, there are some things that you can unsee and there's some things you can't unsee. What he's saying here is not only did my eyes see it, but the eyes of my heart were seared with it. I looked and then I beheld. And this is what I beheld clearly. I saw a white horse. And then there's a rider named. This rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquering. The language is beautiful here. Um, so there's a white horse. The rider held a bow and is given. Is, is a passive tense. He didn't take. Is given. Who would, who would give it to him? God. My Bible says was given. Was given. Yeah, is given, what, but passive tense. Oh, okay. uh, didn't earn, didn't take. It was granted. Okay. You're going to have that phrase granted or given throughout this text, which means that the, the horse is summoned, willed, enacted, and summoned. The rider himself is given stuff. He's given a crown. And he went out, the, in the Greek it's beautiful, it says he went out conquering and to conquer. What does your version say? Bent on conquest. Bent on conquest? That's no, good. No, bent on conquest. As a conqueror to conquer. As a conqueror to conquer. Yeah, and so I think what the language is saying here, and I've written in our notes, the means equals the ends. He's not conquering to do something else. He's conquering for the sake of conquering. That's all he knows. I've written single-minded. The one who rides this horse is, is an outside agent. Um, as we're going to see compared to the next horse, he's one that comes from outside countries and conquers them. And he's not satisfied. He'll conquer the next one and the next one and the next one. That's his whole identity, and he's been given the authority to do that. Uh, we've talked before that whatever the heart wants, the will accomplishes, and the mind justifies. The heart of this writer is day in and day out, 100% conquering. There's nothing else he wants to do. If, God, if, if somebody granted him uh, relief, he would find a way to cash that relief in to conquer more. That's how you know what your God is or what your goal is. You would sacrifice anything else to accomplish that goal. And so his whole hope, the end of his life, is to have conquered everything he's met. Mm -hmm. 
This is the uh, represents Texas A&M football. <laughs> All right. So, have you seen how much we pay our coach? So, uh, there's that, and then. Then again, when the lamb opened the second seal, the rhythm's here again. The lamb opened the second seal. I heard a second living creature say, come. Then, those things have happened. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Yours may say a bright red one. Um, it's rider. The only time that word used, bright red or fiery red, is used one other time, and it's for the red dragon. The red one, uh, its rider was given power. I noticed the language, was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other to him was given a large sword so God will again the rhythm here God wills Jesus and acts in heaven Christ come a red horse appears a rider is given commission to take peace from the earth causing causing which God's intention causing men to slay one another he is given a great sword now, if you compare the two horses so far, the white horse is an external conquest. The red horse is an internal revolution. So the power of that rider is not to go out and cause a nation to invade another nation, but rather that the, that the citizens of that nation will begin to now internally turn on one another, like the French Revolution. Very bloody. So peace is withdrawn. Then you have the third horse, verse 5, When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and beheld there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures. Now notice, the, the command here is coming from where? A heavenly voice coming from God. God's counsel or, or the, uh, the cherubim or seraphim or the four living creatures coming from among them. And so this isn't coming from hell. This is coming from heaven. And this is what the voice says. A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the wine and the oil. So, as we see again, God wills, Jesus enacts, and heaven cries, Come, a black horse... The rider has a pair of scales. He establishes, most scholars will point out, he establishes a famine. He's a, creating a famine. Uh, which is hard to read uh, the further you get down because I grew up listening to, uh, uh, you know, We Are the World. Yeah. We, you know, <laughs> but that was the, no, that was all the, and then Band-Aid. I'm not talking about we shouldn't do foreign aid and we shouldn't help people. That's not the point. And I don't think these are talking about current events. I think these are talking about future events. But uh, God, according to this chapter, wills a famine um, to this extent where the heavenly voice commands uh, that one day's wage can earn a quart of wheat. A quart of wheat is enough to feed that one person. So what he's saying is you can't even feed your family. You can work all day and earn enough groceries for one person to eat. You could, however, buy barley. You can buy three times as much barley, some say twice as much barley, and you could feed more of your family, but barley doesn't have the nutritional con uh, content as good wheat. I didn't know that. We actually cook barley um, broth or barley soup or something. Whatever it is, I eat it. Uh, and so, there's this, there's this uh, established famine where you have, a, you have tough decisions, you have to labor for everything you have, and then even still you have really difficult decisions to make. Now, this is the confusing part, and I I'm, would love to hear from y'all, but uh, do not damage the oil and the wine one group that I was reading today said that this is pointing out that the wealthy would continue to indulge themselves even during this famine. Uh, this could have some sort of spiritual element to it, except none of these have spiritual elements to them so far. It's actually nitty-gritty 
uh, blood, sweat, and tears type stuff. And so I think that's a, a reasonable understanding that uh, though the famine goes on, God reserves his further tribulation and judgments to the wealthy while they watch the poor struggle. Does that make sense? Do any of you all have another interpretation? You're saying God is saying theirs is coming, it's just not coming yet. Yes. Do we know that wealth means monetary? In this case, probably. Things are a lot more... Um, yeah. Because the only true wealthy people, if it's not monetarily, would be the redeemed. So, I mean, that could be it. Uh, in this uh, little note down here, it suggests that uh, it sets limits on the destruction by the writer. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that, I think that could be another, uh, the major point here is that as terrible as this happened, number one is that this is a terrible event. Terrific used to mean terrible. I remember reading a, a paper from, not, uh, from uh, Pearl Harbor and the headline just said terrific. Um, as terrific as this is, it's God's will and it's micromanaged by God. He sets limits. He says, you can't, I'm not allowing you to, to touch the oil and the wine. So, we're going to pause for just... It could still be provision, because how do you bake without oil? I don't know. Could be. Could be just a just, just enough. Could be. I think that's a good point. Now, remember... As we're going to discuss at the end, the, the seals are being cracked, all sixth and then the seventh, and then all the details of the seventh. If we go back to our first point, that the six judgments, there's an interlude showing God's love and mercy for His people, and then the final judgment comes, uh, is final infliction, and it concludes with Jesus' return. The whole point is that this concludes with Jesus' return, which is the best news in the world for the redeemed, and the worst news in the world for the unredeemed. The gospel, it's hard to say it like this, but the book of Revelation shows that the gospel is simultaneously life and good news for some and a death sentence for others. The return of Jesus is the worst part. Not the plagues, not the famine, not the sword. Jesus. Isn't that telling? What God is doing here is stripping away and He's, he's starting to take away all the layers when I, when I work uh, evangelistically with somebody, and uh, I was with a Sunday school class this week, and we discussed soul winning, and what I start off with is telling someone the news. They don't know the news, and I'll tell them about Jesus, and that God, God's demands are greater than we could ever, like, the gap between what God demands and what we offer is so severe that He gave us, He's, he's not only demanding, but He's generous. He gave us Jesus, who lived that life on our behalf, and He died the death we deserve, and if if, you were, if you're attracted, if you're drawn to Jesus, you're part of God's special people. And so as I'm explaining this, my second move after sharing the news is to ask, what was your heart doing when we were talking about Jesus? Because that's the ultimate question. It's to, I didn't bring up heaven and hell. I didn't bring up uh, wrath and mercy to each individual person. I didn't bring, and so what you'll have people do when you're sharing the gospel, they'll say things like, well... My mom was a Protestant, my dad was a Catholic, or, or I had trouble at church growing up. Or the, and I'd say, you're the one that brought church up. I'm not talking to you about the good news of church. I'm talking to you about a man named Jesus. And you have to make a decision on who he is. And that's what we see in the book of Revelation. The, God is, is preparing you the way of the Lord so that those... In advance, if you've met Jesus and made a decision for faith, then... then then you're good. And if you've rejected him, then you're not good. But in the end, everyone will have, their heart will decide. Yes. And it will be life or death. That's the whole point of Deuteronomy when, when God says, here I lay before you. Do not say that I've stored up in heaven who can go and bring it down or across the sea who can go. I'm going to lay before you life and death. Choose life. This is Jesus. Jesus is the law. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the revelation of God. And he is, so I can tell this whole story about 
and I could, I, could, I could sit there and we could read through and quote over a year all 66 books of the Bible. But the question remains, when I was telling you about Jesus, what was your heart doing? Are you attracted to the man, Jesus, or are you just attracted to what he can get you out of? If you're not attracted to Jesus, you're not, a, you're not of the redeemed. And so what he does at the end is he reverse engineers that, strips everything away from the earth, and then shows his son to the earth. And people hate him or they love him. There's no apathetic response to the Lord. And so as much as difficult as this is, as the sovereign will of God is revealed here, it's making a point to lead the pathway forward, and these things are necessary, like birth pangs for the birth to occur. So we see, ultimately, uh, so far the three horses, the Spirit sent out, one causes conquest, one causes lack of peace and slaying, the other causes a famine, and then here's the fourth. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the, four living, the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. In Greek, it's a pale green horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by the sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So the pale horse comes. Again, God's willed this to happen. Jesus enacts it. The heavens cry, come. A pale horse appears. You know, only God can create out of nothing. Exist. He exists. God created this horse for His purposes. The horse appears and the rider is named for the first time. And His name is Death. Hades follows right behind him. In the Greek, it's got this neat language of there's the, it's immediately following uh, on the, uh, the my lawnmower. I've got a bag immediately past the blades. So as soon as it's cut, it's in the bag. It's not like the bag follows behind on another machine to catch him later. It's it's this sense of they're yoked, they're joined. But who's leading? Death. says that authority, does your version say authority? They were given power. They were given power. Let me look it up real quick if it's dunamis or authority. Um, Yours says authority. It's, uh, it's excusia, it's uh, authority. It's uh, liberty or jurisdiction. Uh, power is a, di a different word, uh, generally, but th they're given authority, which includes power, uh, over a fourth of the earth in order, so they are called death and Hades, are given reign over a fourth of the earth to kill in various ways. Um, Next week we will discuss the other two seals, which are the martyrs crying out and comforted, and then the creation itself is laid bare. But as we get to this point, I, I've got three takeaways to consider. Number one is that the path forward is impossible for an unbeliever to accept as good news. If you go back and read the first three, verse, three chapters of Revelation... This is being written to them for their good, for their comfort. So let's say uh, uh, somebody's committed a, a federal offense and, and stole the letter that was written to these seven churches, and they'd say, well, I'm going to read the secrets of the church. And they're reading this. What are they hearing? <laughs> Horrible news. It's almost like a, a secret letter that you have to have a decoder ring to get. If you've got Christ, it's amazing news. But if it's in, it, it is 100% impossible to accept the, the revelation of Jesus Christ as good news unless you're a believer. Which should be a litmus test on why we're so scared to read it in church. It's good news. It's, it's impossible for, for unbelievers. It's, it is possible for those... Uh, because the news includes conquest, slaying, famine, and mass death. That's coming out of the gate. No pun intended with these horses. But that, 
that's where it starts as the, the eternal sovereign will of God to transition from this earth to the next. And that's what this is all about. So the path forward is impossible. Uh, second is, this is the way forward, period. This is the way forward. If you want to have a baby, you're going to have labor pains. This is the way forward. Uh, there's no other way forward. This is it. And so it's almost as if God, now he's writing this to his church, he is warning them, comforting them, explaining this to them. Anything, I've said this recently in our soul winning class. If you're sharing the gospel with somebody, for instance, and you tell them the news, and then you ask them how they feel about Jesus, and they're drawn to Jesus, and you're praising God. Well, there's a young man, in the, not, he's older than me, a guy named Ernest. I don't know if you've met Ernest. He's been with us two weeks in a, in a row. Uh, church members brought him in, and, and he's, he's a former Jehovah's Witness and, and spent a lot of time in prison. And he just, he, when we were sharing this, he, he jumped up and just said, that happened to me. You were, in your, you were there, weren't you, Madonna? And he's just explaining, he said, I used to do this, and then I fell in love with Jesus. And he's explaining Jesus, and he's just so in love with Jesus, which means that no matter what I'm going to tell him next, he's going to be able to take away that. And so that since they have that, and I'm not persuading anybody. I can't, you can't make a heart love somebody. Ask George Strait. Uh, <laughs> so they love Jesus, and I'm like, now that you love Jesus, let's talk. And I, and I name three things. The last thing I say is that you will suffer. Jesus says it up front. Paul says it up front. Peter, James, all of them say it up front. To not say that is called deception. And so what this letter is is the opposite of deception. What God shows His church is, I want you to be informed, not uninformed, my brothers. These things will happen. As Jesus says in His own ways in Mark 13, nations will rise up against nations. There will be earthquakes. The sky will turn black. Woe living in those days. But do not be alarmed, for these things must take place. Jesus told us, didn't He? To not, God has decided in His own will to reveal these things, and therefore we are to read them and exhort the church not to scare people, but to just be up front. If nobody told my wife that having a baby would hurt, because they didn't want to scare her, if that's what they... That's not, a, that's not being a good doctor. I don't, know how, I don't know how the words for what to say now, but get another job. Uh, you need to tell people, this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done physically. And... It's going to hurt in ways that you didn't know you could hurt, and it's going to exhaust you in ways that are going to exhaust. It's more than, a, than 10 marathons in a row. You're going to be so tired. And at the end of the marathon, at the end of the pain, I'm going to hand you a baby so that you start off in a deficit of energy. So that you need me. It's hard. And your husband's worthless in these things. He can't do anything. It just, this is, this is I mean, it's going to be so hard. And yet the cost is worth it. I'm going to give you a shot of endorphins the moment that baby comes. I forget what you call them, but females have this gift. It's a cocktail where you forget the pain. All of it. You know you had it, but you can't re-feel it. You don't remember what it feels like because you're holding this baby. Right? <laughs> now you got... You dissenters over here. <laughs> it would help if it was a woman doctor because she actually knows what it feels like. Maybe. My son mother used to tell Some me do. that you don't have any idea what kind of pain we're talking about. Yeah, I, <laughs> no idea. But my, my wife birthed three kids, yeah. no medicine, in a birthing center. And I was there to see it, and I can tell you one of us was suffering. <laughs> and, uh, and, but... You know, that's got to be the reason God revealed these things, is to tell us that this is the way forward. This is what it's going to include. Burning question. Yes. So why did God reveal it in a cryptic manner that's so hard to understand? Yeah, to... Uh, why did Jesus... Well, my to understand. <laughs> 
I would argue that he, he didn't make it hard to understand. We just choose to make it complicated. Um, the, the, par the parables. Well, here's, here's, a, here's a way I'd say it. First off, the revelation is meant to be read with the Holy Spirit's help. Um, and there, uh, it's intended to be so accessible. These people he was writing to were not educated anywhere near the level we are. It's meant to be accessible, much like the parables of Jesus. And Jesus made it clear, not many can accept this teaching. It's not that the teaching itself was difficult. It's quite easy to grasp. When Jesus says the Son of Man, the Kingdom of God is like a king who went off and crowned himself king, and people didn't want him to be king, and so when he returned, he found the few people who did want him to be king and rewarded them, rewarded them. and those he did, who didn't want him to be king, he said, bring them in front of me and slay them. That's easy to understand. So if I say... And again, I think symbolism is important. But if I say uh, the way forward includes God sovereignly choosing to send out an agent of conquest, and you're going to see conquest. Now, you may not live to see it, but when you're alive, whoever is, you will see someone have conquest in them greater than Napoleon. And you're going to also see famine that just is unbelievably severe. And you're going to see, and it's not going to be... It's going to be foreshadowed with other famines we've had. You know, he writes these things as if we understand what famine is. And we do. But this famine is going to be altogether global and worse. I think he's trying to hand it to us easily. And another, one last point I'd make. If you flip back to chapter 1, how this, is, this all began, if you begin uh, chapter 1, verse 1, the language is real specific here. In fact, I'm going to pull up chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place, he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant. Communicated in, in the Greek means signified it. So... That's how we started this teaching was what we're reading here is not the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the way he chose to show it to us. So the revelation is what happens when you're... Um, he's given us signifiers or, or a movie to watch. And when you're watching this movie, you begin to experience the revelation. They're not one-to-one. -one. This is just the way, uh, because the revelation of Jesus Christ is something that God... I, I'm assuming it's because of our inability to, to apprehend. It's so grand and so powerful that God chose to not dumb it down, but uh, dumb it down. Uh, signify it. He had to translate it into visuals. A movie that John practically watched. A trance that he, he viewed. So what, what Jesus is saying here is that there's a distinction between the actual revelation and the means by which it was shown. And so my, my point is when you're... Um, it's similar to saying a parable. The kingdom of God is like a farmer going out to... It's not the kingdom of God is. It's like. Um, and so the further you get into those 33 parables, the more you start to be able to understand the, the drastic revealing character of a world that will replace this one. Once, you, once we finish Revelation, in fact, we might want to go do a study on some of the parables and give them their teeth back. If a parable doesn't offend you, you're reading it wrong. They're intended, uh, they're intended to upset the apple cart. Because it's talking about a world that's not here. And it's a world that's, that's utterly... Uh, it contradicts this world. And so that's, that's, that's my long and short answer to you, um, Patty, on, on how this works. But I think you can get it. I think you are getting it. it. Let me say one more thing. I also think, and this may be a demonic activity or an evil activity, there is an unfair fear and uh, avoidance of this sacred text. It's unreasonable how afraid people are of the book of Revelation, particularly the saints. 
It's the same sort of evil that somebody could receive Holy Sacrament their whole life and miss that it's supposed to cause them to behold Jesus. It's just a snack. All right, so um, that's two points. This, is a, this way forward is impossible for an unbeliever to accept as good news. Number two, this is the way forward. There's no other way forward. These, this must take place in the same way Jesus said, I must go to Jerusalem. I must be handed over to sinners and crucified. This must, the same way, this, there's no other way forward. And God's kind enough in His mercy to show us in advance. And then number three, God is not allowing it. He's causing it. That's probably the hardest one. I, I wish I had the words to uh, harmonize the tension that causes in our hearts, but uh, I'm not going to because the Bible doesn't do that. Um, all of us start off on our walk so coached by the world that if we don't spend enough time in the world, we will develop a, a vision and Im image of God that is actually counter biblical. And we will, we will have, have you ever put your flag in the ground and say, I will never? <laughs> be careful. Let your yes be yes or your no be no. Because if you, if you, if you do that, there's a high probability that there's going to be a collision down the road between your word and God's word, and proud people won't change. And so I have heard, I have said myself, I can't believe in a God who. Don't do that. Just say, I believe in the God of the Bible. I believe in the God revealed in Scripture, and there's a lot about God I don't understand yet. And there's a lot about God I've changed my, my understanding of through His grace. And there's a lot we won't understand. Exactly. But... If there's anything we can get so far from the revelation of Jesus Christ, which was given to him by the Father, it's that what is going to take place isn't allowed by God, it's caused by God. And Jesus doesn't come in to bail us out at the last second because of all these evil things. These are actually the heralds, the, the, this precipitates his return. And if you'll also notice, by the way, Zionists, humans aren't doing these things. This isn't us getting the right person in to Israel and Netanyahu and the, then the stars align and then we set our tanks and we're voting the right guy. Into. God's will is not determined by our actions. Our actions are determined by God's will. So the, what will precipitate the return of Jesus Christ is in the hand of God. It's worth it. It's good. I pray this is comforting for you as we wrestle through these things. Before we pray, one announcement. Next week I'll be at church camp uh, teaching the same stuff. I'm kidding. Uh, to, to third and fourth graders. Uh, ben Todd is going to be our teacher next week. Uh, ben, what was your, your topic on? Is it First Thessalonians? Yes, first chapter. First chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, ben is an amazing teacher. He's a He's a... Very, come next week. Uh, then we'll pick up the week after that with Revelation 6, and we'll do the last uh, seals 5 and 6. So let's pray. Mighty Father, we, um, we do thank you for giving us ears to hear and that you've called us forth to listen. God, as we've been exposed to these things, we pray that the Spirit would continue to keep preaching. May you uh, make it clear to us what's happening, and uh, what it looks like for us to today to overcome. May we, uh, may we rejoice that the future, that our best, everything good, the best stuff is not behind us but ahead of us. And so may we not be afraid of the path forward. God, we are going to see things that Moses has never seen. We're going to experience things that even Jesus Christ, your Son, is begging for you to complete. God, you are the one who moves the stars and the, the seasons of our lives. You are the one who is sovereign over all things. And you tell us that the last act, which is to come, is greater than all others, and that we can trust you. 
And so we trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.